Good afternoon and welcome to MF Corner. I'm Sumera Abdi and on the show today, first we're going to talk about what are floater funds, floating rate funds and why they're useful for you. What do they mean in the current environment? SRE's Kirtan Shah will join in to explain that. And a little later on the show, we'll talk about one of the queries which I've got a lot, which is when people ask me, when do we use overnight funds or liquid funds or money market funds or ultra short term funds? You know, they're quite overlapping. So how do we know which is good for which use? Well, we'll have Kalpesh Ashur of Full Circle Financial Planners joining in to talk about that in just a bit. But first up, let's talk about floating rate funds. Hi, Kirtan. Good afternoon. And uh, thanks very much for joining in. First up, you know, before we actually get down to talking about why floating rate funds make sense, first up, let's set up the premise on which this concept of uh, floating rate bonds or floating rate funds, uh, you know, is made. Um, what is the risk that it caters to or rather the risk that it eliminates from somebody's portfolio and what exactly is it? Hi, Sumaira. Thank you so much for having me on the show. So, Sumaira, while anybody is doing any debt-related investments, I think there are three major risks that uh, uh, the investor should always keep in mind. Uh, the first one is the credit risk that all of us over the last 24 months have experienced in the form of LNFS, DHFL, where the principal is at stake. The second risk is the liquidity risk, where we say, that, uh, you know, while I want my money back out of investment, either I don't get it back because it's locked in, or uh, while I'm trying to premature uh, withdraw it, it probably charges me a small penalty. Now, uh, credit and liquidity risk among the three risks that I intend to talk of, these two risks, in my opinion, are very product dependent. So if you can get your product choice uh, or composition correct, to a greater extent, these risks can be eliminated or reduced at worst. But the third risk, which is the interest rate risk, in my opinion, is very cyclical in nature. And uh, unless you get the timing of your investment correct in the right product, it is very difficult to get rid of uh, this particular uh, risk. So what is interest rate risk? Let's say, for example, if an investor is investing in a fixed deposit, at let's say eight and a half or nine percent for one year. And after having invested, after a year when the maturity proceed comes in and the investor is trying to reinvest, the interest rate in the economy has lowered and hence probably the investor is getting one or two percent lower in reinvesting. Or the other way around, let's say the client is uh, uh, investing today in the current market situation and in an FD close to five percent and uh, the investment is done for five years, but over a period of time, the interest rates in the economy start shooting up. Now, when the interest rate in the economy starts shooting up, but you are stuck at 5% FD for five years, it is again a risk, right? Now, imagine a situation where you've invested in a traded paper, a traded bond, which uh, pays you a coupon of 5%, 6%, and interest rate in the economy goes up. While interest rate in the economy goes up and you are stuck with a lower rate, a lower uh, coupon bond, that bond which is traded in the market typically ends up falling in value in the market. Now, this, according to me, is the prevailing problem or probably uh, a risk that a lot of investors will now encounter in investing in debt, while after investments, interest rates will start going up. Now, if you see historically, Sumera, over the last 25 years, there have been only two instances where the 10-year GSEC rate in India has fallen below 6%. One was in 2003 and 4, another was in 2008 and 9, where the rates had gone down to 5.2 odd. Now, today, if you look at the last 10 years, interest rates have not gone down below 6% on the 10-year GSEC. But today, we are at 5.88 or 5.9. So I believe that there is very little downside to... Uh, falling interest rates in the near term. And uh, exactly where most investors will face a lot of trouble in investing in fixed income if they don't get their product mix correct. And uh, if interest rates have to start going up, that may happen in six months from today, getting the right product mix is extremely important in debt investing. And is exactly where I believe floating rate bonds or floating rate funds can come into picture. Okay, so then what an average investor understands from floating rate bonds is that the interest rate keeps changing, right? So how does that happen? 
So let me give you uh, one very simple example of the latest product that came out, which was the RBI floating rate bond. Now, RBI floating rate bond was uh, initially issued at 7.15%. Now, this coupon is not fixed. It's variable or floating. It is linked to the National Savings Certificate's uh, uh, coupon rate. So let's say today the National Savings Certificate coupon rate is 6.8%. And the RBI floating rate offers you 0.35% more than the NSE's rate. So if the NSE rate tomorrow has to go down to 6.5, then the RBI floating rate bond will automatically start quoting at 6.5 plus 0.35, which is 6.85. So these bonds don't offer you a fixed coupon, generally the way most fixed income products in India operate, but they typically float. They keep moving up and down because they are benchmarked to an index. Now, that index can be repo, that index can be your 10-year GSEC, that can be MIBOR, or that can be a product like NSE in RBI's floating rate bonds case. So it is not constant, it keeps moving up and down. Okay, and I guess anybody who would have taken a home loan would know the uh, concept pretty well, right? Uh, but Kirtan, um, you know, why not a dynamic bond fund? I mean, do you think a floating rate uh, uh, fund sort of is superior to that? And in the current environment, uh, what is the recommendation? So, Sumera, I believe, uh, look, interest rates, like I just mentioned to you, I don't see a lot of downside from here on. Right? And if interest rates have to start moving up, it can end up uh, creating interest rate risk in the, the debt portfolio of investors. What happens in a floating rate fund is typically, as per SEBI's uh, scheme categorization, the objective of the floating rate mutual funds is to invest 65% of the money in floating rate bonds. Now, automatically what happens is while you end up investing in a floating rate uh, 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 mutual fund, you are indirectly investing in 65% floating rate bonds. So if tomorrow interest rates have to start moving up, automatically that 65% uh, portfolio will automatically start earning a higher coupon, by which it will not have the interest rate risk which a debt fund would generally have. And that is how I, I would like to believe that the coupon will also keep increasing in those funds and the capital risk which typically works out in a rising interest rate in a debt fund will also be negated. So my suggestion is that some portion of your overall debt allocation can be made to floating rate funds in the current situation, Sumaira. Okay, but you know, Kirtan, if that's the case, I mean, why aren't they more widely uh, seen in investor portfolios? I mean, I've hardly seen people talk about, uh, you know, floating rate funds when they give recommendations. Um, what's the reason for it? And do you recommend that most investors have it? I mean, what's an ideal time horizon? You say that it should be just about a year, uh, but can't it be, you know, longer? Can't it be a part of somebody's core portfolio? So, Sumera, unfortunately, in India, we do not have a lot of floating rate bonds available in which floating rate mutual funds can actually invest, right? So, that's one major problem in the floating rate uh, uh, investing category. So, what mutual funds typically end up doing is, so they buy the normal uh, fixed rated bonds, but they do something called as interest rate swaps, by which they convert the existing fixed rate product into a floating rate bond. It's a derivative product by which a fixed rated bond is indirectly converted into a floating rate bond. Now, because there are not a lot of floating rate products available in the market, which is why we see a comment, we see a little less commentary around floating rate products in the market. Now, in my opinion, any investor who's looking at at least a one year time frame in terms of investment can definitely look at this particular product. And uh, for me, this can definitely form a part of the core portfolio of an investor where if at all, uh, while choosing the product, if uh, credit risk is paid attention to and taken care of, right, then interest rate risk is inherently taken care of by the product. So this definitely can form part of uh, any investor's portfolio, but I would suggest a minimum time frame of at least a year and above. All right, uh, Kirtan, thanks very much for joining in. So there you have it. If you're looking at a time frame of, uh, you know, at least a year, if not more, 
uh, do consider floating rate interest, uh, sorry, floating rate funds, but uh, do also remember to consult your financial planner before making changes to your portfolio. On the other side, we're going to talk about the other end of the spectrum, which is very short-term debt funds. So a lot of people have wondered when to use overnight versus liquid versus money market versus ultra short duration bond funds. So we'll talk about all of that next with Kalpesh Asher of Full Circle Financial Planners. Hi, welcome back. You're watching MF Corner and joining me now is Kalpesh Asher of Full Circle Financial Planners. And the topic at hand today is how do you decide, uh, you know, which short term debt fund to use? Uh, you know, I mean, there's a lot of confusion between overnight, liquid, money market or even an ultra short uh, duration bond fund because there's a lot of overlap, right? So how do you decide which requirements should be filled by which fund. So Kalpesh hopes to do just that, advise us on this. Hi Kalpesh, good afternoon. Uh, let's start off with the overnight fund, right? I mean, what is the specific requirement that this is suited for and what's the kind of investor who can use it? Uh, good afternoon, Samara. Uh, the topic which we've selected today, you know, is uh, a bit of an intermingling, uh, you know, topic uh, amongst a lot of things. Uh, in debt funds and many people have this uh, inbuilt confusion as to which uh, type of short term funds to use. So starting with overnight funds, as the name suggests, uh, the overnight funds invest in uh, absolutely the debt securities which uh, have a maturity of one day. And uh, that is the shortest possible uh, you know, type of uh, paper which uh, an individual can have. It's a rollover of just one day and uh, the investment uh, horizon also of people investing in this cannot be ideally more than I would say two to three days to max a fortnight. And uh, as the duration is short, as we know in debt funds, the element of risk in uh, an overnight fund probably amongst the entire uh, gamut of debt funds is I would say uh, least risky and uh, next to I think just 0.01%. Uh, uh, that's what uh, in overnight funds it is. Now, ideally, uh, overnight funds would invest in, uh, uh, you know, papers uh, which offer flexibility of withdrawal. And as uh, uh, the, the interest rates uh, which we are uh, seeing right now, there is no scope for uh, absolutely earning any capital gains uh, in that. And uh, I would say this is a good alternate for corporates. Uh, who park their money for, uh, you know, just a duration of three to four days, the large sum which they would not earn any interest uh, in a current account. Uh, this would uh, offer a good uh, option for them for parking this money in an overnight fund with the least element of risk. Okay, uh, and you know, one thing that I want to clarify for viewers because I've also got this uh, doubt, which is, uh, you know, that investors can invest in overnight funds for longer than a day. It's just that the fund manager invests in securities which mature in a day. So they will, you know, wake up this morning, buy securities, hold it overnight, sell it tomorrow morning, and the process starts again. Investors, of course, do not. So, Kalpesh, uh, you know, what about liquid funds then? I mean, if overnight is a category that's more suitable for corporates, uh, you know, liquid too is something that we understand is mostly used by corporates. Should retail be looking at it? Yeah, so now liquid funds uh, has a little bit more of an extended uh, investment time horizon, like you rightly said, by the fund uh, managers and as per mandate uh, given by SEBI recently. So in that, the mandate of uh, investment given is maturities up to 91 days. So uh, automatically, the duration of all the relevant papers and ideally the treasury bills, the, uh, you know, the uh, uh, repurchase agreements which are there and the commercial papers which are there, all would fall in the ambit of uh, 91 days. 
And uh, in liquid funds, the, the best part is that it's a very low cost and low risk products. And as the name uh, even uh, suggests, it is highly liquid. And uh, the fund managers ensure that the best quality of papers is uh, put into that uh, liquid funds. And uh, like uh, even answering the first question, uh, Samira, absolutely there's no binding on anybody not to hold their investment uh, more than the stipulated period of what the fund uh, houses do amongst themselves, be it an overnight fund, which has got a maturity of one day or liquid uh, funds, which has got a maturity of uh, 91 days. The investor can keep holding it as per what he wants. But ideally, when we say uh, liquid funds also would serve the purpose of creating a good uh, you know, uh, option for uh, your contingency fund or an emergency fund. And as we've seen uh, that the interest rate regime is coming down drastically. So there's not much of a difference now between the savings bank uh, interest rate or the short term FD and a liquid fund. Otherwise, the liquid fund also offers you a good option to do your STPs. Uh, and uh, the large amount of money parked in liquid funds, I think it's got the largest amount of AUMs uh, held uh, amongst the debt funds, uh, is a good way that uh, even uh, you know, the retail investor uh, looks at parking his money and then doing an STP into the same scheme of the same fund house. So liquid funds per se, uh, although the name is liquid, let me add one more thing of uh, crucial uh, you know, importance here, is that uh, RBI has imposed an exit load of up to seven days. So there's a gradual type of a, a tapering thing, which uh, as you can uh, see in the thing, there's a minute exit load element in that. So uh, even corporates uh, need to park their money for that stipulated period or else they face a certain exit load. And uh, one more thing is that uh, it could be as a substitute uh, for your very short term bank FDs and many liquid funds uh, also uh, people, the financial planners advise uh, for a short duration, I would say three to six month period for attaining a short term financial goal as well. Okay, so, uh, so far what we've uh, discovered is that one, overnight funds can be left aside by retail investors, uh, largely meant for, uh, you know, corporates to use. Liquid fund is something that can be, uh, you know, used to serve an emergency or a contingency requirement. Uh, basically, you know, everybody who had money in savings bank account could actually, you know, look at this uh, uh, as parking for their emergency requirements. What about money market funds? Because here as well, the average maturity is up to one year, right? So if I anyways have the option of a liquid fund available as a retail investor, do I need to consider a money market fund at all? Uh, that's a very, uh, I would say, confusing question. And uh, uh, ideally, when you say money market funds, when the horizon automatically stretches uh, from, uh, you know, anything between, uh, you know, uh, 30 days to one year, the element of risk, which we understand in debt funds, as the duration prolongs, uh, is a little bit more higher. And uh, in money market uh, instruments, which we've seen, uh, that the element of, apart from the interest uh, risk, which is inherent, uh, the fund managers also have a liberty to, uh, you know, have uh, commercial papers introduced. And as soon as commercial papers are introduced, they are also introduced to credit risk. So there's a dual uh, interest and credit risk, uh, which is then uh, inherently possible in a money market uh, type of a fund. And uh, in the recent uh, past, uh, not too far away, we've seen uh, minute accidents happen in uh, you know, uh, these short term categories also. So my suggestion is that uh, if you want uh, to have a contingency or a short term goal, or even if you want to uh, have, uh, you know, your uh, uh, short term alternate to your bank FD or a savings account. My limitation would be to stick to liquid funds at one end of the spectrum for a retail investor or else then jump to the next category, which is the ultra short term, where uh, at least, you know, we find that uh, the maturity of bonds, the quality of paper is a little bit more better. So money market, like what you rightly said, that the duration is up to one year and uh, in money market also, uh, the interest rate and credit risk becomes right. quite uh, eminent. Hmm. Okay, we're almost out of time, Kalpesh. So I'm going to quickly squeeze in the last one, and which is very popular, which is the ultra short duration bond fund. Uh, we've seen an accident happen, uh, you know, with Franklin in this category. Um, is this a category uh, for retail investors? And if so, exactly what is the purpose it serves? 
Yeah, so ultra short is, uh, you know, by nature, you can invest up to three to six months uh, as per SEBI regulation. But ultra short term bond funds have been given the leeway to invest between three months to 18 months. Now, in that, when the spectrum opens up, uh, ideally, it becomes a good vehicle. Although with uh, the inherent risks are always there, let everyone understand that once and for all. Uh, it can be a good tool for even doing your STPs. You, it can also be serving as a contingency fund. And apart from that, retail investors can look at some part of it as an asset allocation towards debt also. But I think mainly for contingency fund, for STPs, and as a, uh, I, I would say, one to two year alternate to your short term bank FDs, ultra short term funds need to be looked at. And lastly, I would like to add one thing, Sumera, is that all investors in debt funds need to live with the fact now that we are in an inherent low interest rate regime. So do not chase higher returns in debt funds. Check the credit quality of the portfolio. Go in for lower duration and do not chase the alpha in debt funds because the type of, you know, the after effects of this pandemic, uh, what it has on corporates, on their balance sheets, yes. it's yet to be seen. So I would leave that with a word of caution that mm. in the short term category, Use this for the minimal purposes which you all have for the uh, reasons specified and do not chase an extra return because anything of these funds in the last one to two years, the returns yeah. have been in the last one year has been between three to I would say five to six percent. Okay, so basically every category has its own purpose. So use it for the intended purpose and not across purposes. Kalpesh, thanks very much. We'll wind down on MF Corner. Do stay tuned. The news continues on CNBC TV 80. CNBC TV 18 presents.